Um, so uh, welcome everybody for the webinar of uh, today. That's the first webinar of the year. And uh, the speaker of today is, uh, is uh, Stefan Zaleski. Uh, and the topic of today is the investigation of a calf replicating experiment in the context of aerosol carried uh, disease propagation. Uh, as usual, I uh, introduce the speaker very briefly and then I leave him the stage. Uh, so Stefan Zaleski is a professor of mechanics at Sorbonne uh, Université uh, and member of the Institut Jean uh, d'Alembert. Uh, after his PhD at Ecole Normale Supérieure in uh, Paris uh, and early state years uh, at the physics laboratory of uh, ENS, he joined the mechanics group at uh, UPMC uh, Paris. -6. Uh, he investigated uh, is, he investigates numerical methods for multiphase flow with application to atomization, cavitation, force media flow, boiling, hydrometallurgy, moving contact lines, and droplet impact, including several variants of the volume of fluid method, the diffuse interface method, and molecular dynamics. He has written several computer codes for the simulation of two-phase flow, including pa Paris Simulator with uh, Daniel Fuster, uh, Y. Ling, uh, R. Scandovelli, and uh, G. Trigbasson. Um, recently, he applied these techniques uh, uh, to the study of COVID-19 uh, 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 transmission for micro-sized uh, uh, droplets. He is associate editor of uh, Journal of uh, Computational Physics and uh, Computers and Fluids. He leads the ERC project uh, TrueFlow on uh, mass transfer at large Schmidt number, and he's a member of the Institut uh, uh, Université de France. So it's with uh, great pleasure that I leave the stage to uh, Stefan Zaleski. So Stefan, I stop sharing my screen. I so, think you need to share yours once again. Okay, okay so do you, do you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about uh, a cough replicating experiment. This is a, a type of experiment that allows us in the lab uh, to study the formation of droplets. And of course, uh, this is very important in the context of the current pandemic, but more, also more in general in the context of the transmission of um, respiratory diseases, which is a long, uh, a long term problem. And um, as you have, you'll see, this problem has involved atomization and uh, log normal distributions for a long time. And so, I'm, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be in the Campe de Ferrier Laboratory and to uh, talk about um, something essentially linked to turbulence um, and uh, to uh, the statistical analysis of turbulence to which Campe de Ferrier was uh, a great precursor. Uh, so, uh, if I give you a very short history of, of what happened, uh, well, go back to Pasteur, and it turns out Pasteur thought that uh, the pathogens, the, whatever the microbes were, were transmitted by dust particles. So that's why uh, people were um, using vacuum cleaners in their houses in the, in the 30s, because uh, it was uh, believed to uh, remove disease, not only because you wanted your your floor to look nice and clean. And um, why is there no uh, mandatory vacuuming today, but there are mandatory masks? Well, um, in fact, uh, um, that was already um, very much insisted upon during the influenza epidemic. Uh, but uh, now we, we don't believe so much that uh, the diseases are transmitted by dust. We believe they are transmitted by droplets. And that is what, um, uh, Wells um, has done in uh, 1930. He studied mostly tuberculosis and he, in fact, introduced log normal distributions for uh, the, the aerosols, the droplets, but he made maybe a kind of uh, simplification. He introduced this idea that there were large droplets above five microns and small droplets below five microns. And then the doctor started um, trying to find out whether the droplets in a particular disease were larger or smaller than five micron. And it's absolutely not the way that physicists or uh, fluid mechanicians think. We basically think in statistical terms about a distribution. So I, I will um, uh, discuss that um, more in depth in what follows. So here I'm, I'm showing you a, a video. So I'm going to um, 
to change screens to show you this video briefly. Um, and so, um, this is the video I want to show you. Uh, just a second, we, yeah, yeah. now we see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, here you're seeing a video of um, a person um, sneezing. Mm, so mm, you see this kind of uh, large puff of droplets being created. I can go back to the beginning of the video. It's really interesting because at a very short distance, what you see very clearly are these very large droplets that fall to the ground. So this is basically the droplets that people thought were responsible for the disease in the early times of the pandemic, um, two years ago. And, and now people think, no, this, these are the small droplets that you see around here that are responsible for the transmission of the disease. So that by itself, it's a striking reversal. And if you have questions about that, I am happy to answer them at the end of the talk. Um, so let me now change screens and go back to this one. Um, so this is uh, this um, movie I've seen was um, is from uh, Lydia Bruiba, and it clearly shows you the, the importance of uh, of atomization here. Uh, with uh, on the basis of that movie and other works by Bruiba, uh, um, Balachander and, and I made a model of a kind of puff. Uh, maybe like a heel spherical vortex or something more uh, turbulent and complicated. We basically you write some equations for drag on this puff, for um, entrainment, uh, the increase of volume of the puff and the density, etc. And um, you obtain a system of coupled equations. Uh, interestingly, these equations can be integrated, uh, but um, also more practically, you can uh, integrate them numerically. And um, it works pretty well. And you get this kind of uh, evolution of this puff, and it probably has a trajectory going up because usually your um, exhalation, what you expel from your lungs, is warm. So it's hot. So by, um, by buoyancy, uh, it goes up by, um, by a type of uh, convection effect, it goes up. And, um, and so you can um, view all of this in this movie. You can see the slide going up. You can um, use this puff model to find the velocity time scale, the thermals time scale, the fluid settling velocity, etc. And But the thing that is really hard to know uh, for sure is the initial distribution of droplet sizes. And um, uh, to visualize uh, how these droplets are formed, you can look at these, uh, these photographs. And uh, one thing you see is that um, you have um, uh, these kind of structures here, which are called the ligaments or rims. And in between these structures, inside these structures, you have sheets. The sheets are harder to see. Maybe they're easiest uh, to see here, thin sheets of liquid. And then holes from in these sheets of liquid and um, the, the ligaments become uh, untethered to, to each other. And then the ligaments break into droplets. You can see here the breakup of the ligaments with this so-called beads on string uh, process. That is, you have a, a thin thread and big droplets on top of the thin thread or smaller droplets. And this is a characteristics of a non-Newtonian flow. But the first stage here and here um, does not involve any non-Newtonian phenomena. It's only the final stage of the breakup of the ligaments, which is non-Newtonian. So we're going to consider that this is Newtonian and proceed. So we put this in a box and we try to simulate it or make experiments. But before we do the experiments and the simulations, let's look at the literature. Uh, Duguid and did a very nice papers in 1946, and they, it's hard to do better than, than he did. He had distribution droplet sizes, which are rather reliable, up to 10 microns. And this is how the distributions uh, 
looks um, in uh, in his um, presentation of the data, but you can uh, um, also look at uh, data by Ludon and Roberts. So uh, it looks a bit different. It's probably unreliable below 20 microns. So it's not clear what uh, this, this means. Um, and then you can superpose all of this data. And that really becomes striking because you see that by superposing all the data, it's a very clear trend of this blue line between um, two millimeters here and about uh, 10 microns. And this, this straight line of uh, slope two uh, in log log is a so-called Pareto law. And the Pareto law is uh, somehow known in economics, but it's also known in other areas of science. And it's an algebraic law for a probability distribution. So this is the one over d squared Pareto law. The, the exponent um, could be different it would still be a Pareto law, but it would be, of course, another type of Pareto law. So um, I, I, this was really striking because until, until I looked at this data uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, in the literature, people were interpreting this distribution as a superposition of log normals. So if uh, a log normal in a log log plot um, is, um, is a parabola, okay? And um, it has this shape. And um, uh, it, it, it is easy to try to fit a parabola to any bump in this curve. You can put, put another parabola here. It does not mean anything uh, to me. It doesn't mean anything that is the only thing that you can get really is a, is a trend like this. It not, will not be the case in other experiments, but in this case, I don't think the log normal makes sense. You can look at other more recent uh, data. This is um, data from 2013. And they look really different. Are, you have two modes, you have two bumps instead of, uh, instead of one. Uh, but um, if you look more carefully, this is a volume frequency. So you have multiplied this type of curves, which are frequency curves by, by d cubed to have a volume instead of a number. And so that depresses the small d. And moreover, this is, uh, not a log plot, but a linear plot. So that explains why these two plots look so completely different. And perhaps this gap that you see here has something to do with uh, this type of gaps here. So I, I don't think at all that this and this are contradictory. And I rather mm, believe the, um, uh, the digweed plot. But we are going to uh, see that we, we did experiments that uh, give a fresh, uh, a fresh view on this. Um, so let's first look uh, at how we would do the, the numerics. Uh, so we have, of course, solved the Navier-Stokes equations. This is for multi-phase flow. So the viscosity is inside the divergence here. You have this singular term, which is a surface tension. Um, the interface is resolved and we move it either by specifying its velocity or we move it uh, using this weak formulation for the characteristic function. And, um, and so we perform atomization simulation. So I, I did this little graph to show you how rapidly the, the topic is, uh, is progressing. Um, every six years, approximately, we have um, a new milestone. And so, for example, between uh, 2004 and 2010, we went to from 5 million grid points to 6 billion grid points. And now we have 4 trillion grid points, the equivalent, because we're now using um, octree grids. So that is, uh, we don't refine everywhere. But if you refine everywhere the same accuracy, that would be equivalent to 4 trillion grid points. And that was done by um, uh, two students in our lab. From all these studies of atomization and from the study, experimental studies, um, um, shown two pictures here with experimental studies, you can have the idea that atomization proceeds in four steps. You have a primary instability, uh, usually kelvin helmholtz instability. Then you form holes, uh, you form sheets. This, uh, I told you about these sheets um, here in uh, Lydia's experiments. You can see them here in another simulation we did. Then you get holes in these sheets. You know, get the formation of Taylor Kulik rings at the end of the sheets or of ligaments. So 2B and 3 are the formations of rims and ligaments. 
And finally, for the, um, you have rupture of the ligaments. There are other um, mechanisms by which droplets form. For example, you have also droplets that form at the edge, edge of the rim. So at this, and this, uh, this is an expanding hole. At the edge of this hole, you can have also ligaments and droplets forming. Or at the edge of this rim, you can have uh, droplets forming, maybe a bit like what you see here. Mm. So this is the, the kind of four-step, roughly, mechanism of atomization. And because of uh, the, so the final step is ligament breakup, we want to know what is the distribution of droplet sizes for a given ligament. So there are several candidates. Uh, I've written uh, six different candidates here. That's um, way too many. I've given equations for two mechanisms, the log normal and the gamma. Uh, but um, maybe none of this uh, distribution is correct. You, we have to investigate. Uh, uh, and Fortunately, the ligament breakup problem is relatively simple. It's relatively cheap to uh, solve for an axisymmetric ligament. So we can have a rather precise idea from simulation of what is the statistical solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. So we'll generate huge ensembles, more than 10 to the five droplets in our ensembles. And we set things up with uh, some initial noise, as you can see here. Um, we specify a, a specific uh, on sorgon number that is a, an, it's a combination of viscosity and surface tension for a given ligament size. Um, we take a very elongated ligaments. Um, length over width ratio is about 100. And we generate initial conditions that uh, is quite uh, standard. We use air water viscosity and density ratio. Um, already discussed on a sorgonomic and aspect ratio, and the ratio of uh, the initial noise to the ligament diameter is 8%. So that's a very small initial noise. And so the ligament uh, size evolves like this. Um, and uh, so you have a main peak here, which corresponds to the Rayleigh plateau instability, the instability of a cylinder. You have a secondary peak, which uh, we'll try to explain. And you also have a peak here at much smaller diameters uh, by a factor of four or five. This secondary peak correspond to set, corresponds to satellite droplets. And you see the first two distribution of droplet sizes are shown at time 12 and 14. And these times correspond to the maximum of the average droplet count. That means that the first you have breakup and the droplets, droplet number increases, and then you have the maximum number of breakups, and then you have coalescence and the droplet number decreases. So we are near this maximum, and that's where we're going to look at the statistics. Um, so here are the visualizations of the simulations of uh, ligament breakup. So you have here these uh, Rayleigh plateau modes that form, it leads to these three central droplets. You have other regions where um, the breakup happens happens later. You see the satellite droplets like here and here and here. And after some uh, relatively long time, you're going to have a coalescence. For example, here you have coalescence of this satellite droplet with uh, this, uh, this droplet here. Mm. You don't have that many uh, coalescence at time uh, 16. Uh, so, as I said, you have a really plateau, satellite, secondary drop. That is what I already said. Um, the satellite drop sizes agree with pre the previous literature. Um, this was a little bit uh, tricky because we thought there were satellite droplets were a bit too large, but in fact, no, it's, uh, they're in agreement with what you see in the literature. And um, mm, uh, we have an absence of end pinching mode. This is a bit surprising. Uh, and pinching modes, which were studied by a number of other numerical analysis of this phenomena, predict droplet sizes, which are about 1.5. But uh, we don't see them, and probably because of our initial conditions. Mm, so these are the characteristic uh, wave numbers in the Fourier space. And mm, we now focus on the first stage of breakup. So you see here, we zoom on this region. And we see this, this sequence of peaks, and you can also see them in linear log terms. And this sequence of peaks 
corresponds to well-defined uh, droplet sizes. And this can be explained. They basically vary like the diameter of the, the first peak times n to the one third. And this n to the one third is just this, the addition of the volumes of coalescing droplets. So you coalesce all, for example, here are three droplets and you get three times the volume. And so the, the volume is, um, uh, gives a diameter, an equivalent, di equivalent diameter, and the diameter of a sphere of the same volume, uh, of uh, which is three times uh, to the one third. Okay, three to the one third times the original diameter. So this works really reasonably well, and it gives us an idea of the mechanism that uh, um, generates this distribution. Um, we can then try to find some models, and a model that works relatively well is to say the length of the ligament pieces that gives droplets is a Poisson process. And that gives you a, a volume, which is a so-called volume-weighted Poisson, that is a, um, gives you an x squared e to the minus x cube. And uh, so it, it works rather well in the tail, but we'll look at this in, uh, in more detail. Uh, so, uh, before we look at this in uh, more detail, um, there is a, a notion of um, how long the ligament can be before it breaks. If I, it's called the, we call it the Dreisen cutoff because of the paper by Dreisen, Jerison, Wischof, Torsky, and Lose. And to go back here in this case, for example, once you make some breakups and you'd create these bigger, bigger corrugated uh, ligament pieces, uh, what's the probability that the big piece is going to break up again at this and that location? If the, if the piece is, is very smooth, it, uh, it will not break before the ends recede. You will have a, a contraction of the ligament before it breaks uh, at the next. And so it will give you only one droplet. But if uh, the ligament is very long, it will have time to break before it, uh, it retracts. So the number of droplets you, you get is limited by the initial noise. So if I go back to the Dreisen cutoff, you see eta prime is uh, the initial noise. And it's the log of the initial noise that, cont um, that controls the critical aspect ratio for the survival of a, of a ligament. And this gives you a critical aspect ratio of about 2.5. So it, um, it seems to be around here. And um, it's not very well verified because we have bigger droplets, right? So um, this can be uh, taken only as an order of magnitude. Mm. Uh, if we look at the tail in more detail, we, we see, we zoom on the, on the tail of the distribution, we can the tail of the distribution is the only way we can distinguish between the various uh, distribution uh, functional forms because it is uh, there in, uh, in log linear terms, each distribution has a different behavior. Uh, you take the log of the e to the minus x cube, for example, which you have here, the log should decrease like, my, um, like minus x cube. But if you take uh, a Poisson as, uh, or gamma as you had uh, at the beginning. Sorry, if you take a gamma like this, it, this decreases linearly and the uh, log normal decreases quadratically like minus x squared. So you, in ideal, you should see minus x, minus x squared of minus x cubed, and you should know which is which. Uh, but in fact, um, it, it's not the, the three best fits by the three types of law. Gaussian, gamma, and log normal are very close to each other. And it's not clear that one is better than the other. Maybe the Gaussian drops off too quickly, but the gamma and the log normal are, um, seem to be uh, all right. Okay. And so that is a, a real, um, uh, well, I'll say a, a real difficulty because uh, there is uh, no way to to really um, mm, distinguish uh, between, uh, between these laws. So there's no ideal law for the, the ligament uh, breakup. Mm, so that's the conclusion I have here. But nevertheless, what you get is 
apart from a tail, you have the, the ligaments give you mostly droplets around the really tail or breakup. So if you once you have ligaments of a of a given diameter, you mostly get droplets around this diameter and uh, a few uh, satellite droplets. So um, the main issue here is to find what uh, what are the mm, what is the ligament diameter and uh, so for that you need to understand um, um, the the global process of uh, of atomization so let's now um, leave aside the, the ligaments for a while and go back to the whole process of atomization and we're of course going to study this process of atomization in the specific context of cough so we're going to simulate what um, I like to call a cough machine. It's a machine which was uh, um, first developed by King, Rock and Londo in 1965. So they have uh, this, uh, um, this, uh, this valve here, you have a free stream of, of air. You tranquilize the turbulence in this, uh, mm, in this porous uh, um, medium and and then you atomize a thin layer of liquid, which is represented here. And um, they wrote that it is a mucus simulant, because basically what they wanted to um, study is um, how mucus goes up in your trachea when you cough. And, and But they don't want to study atomization, they just wanted to study the waves which are created when you cough. Uh, but with this group of people, um, so that's the title of a talk, uh, that was prepared by this guy, Palaf Kant, and that I gave at the APS. So Palaf has, um, mm, uh, has actually is the guy who did the experiment. He's in the group of Detlef, and uh, Youssef was both a student of, uh, of us here in Paris and of Detlef, also contributed, and um, Caesar did the simulations, and Stefan did the famous uh, Basilisk code. So this is the modern cuff machine. Um, so it's the essentially the same machine that was done by uh, Brock, uh, but uh, mm, with um, modern technology or a modern visualization, I would say. And so you you have this transparent channel. You have a scraper to uh, control the thickness of the initial uh, um, layer. And uh, you have the pressurized vessel here with a tranquilizing um, honeycomb uh, for laminarization of the flow. And it's two centimeters by one centimeter. Um, the viscosity is that of a water glycerol mixture that is uh, be from the viscosity of water to, uh, to 50 or 100 times the viscosity of water. Surface tension is around the surface tension of water. And the flow velocity goes from 10 to 30 meters per second. There, there are some cuffs events that go up to 100 meters per second. That's really tremendously fast. But here we limit ourselves to 30 meters. And um, it's already uh, very complex, as you all see. So this is our first uh, experimental movie. And you maybe want to remember how it looked like for the human experiment by Lydia Buriba. And it, it's very much the same. You have these big, big droplets that tend to fall to the ground. And then you have this huge stream of very small droplets that maybe you see in more detail here. Now the big droplets are getting close to the camera, so you really see them in great detail. And you start seeing the, some sheets being ejected. Also, it's less clear than in, uh, in Lydia's photographs. Mm. And you see here some... Uh, Maybe you can see some uh, sheets bursting here, but um, it's not uh, as clear as it, uh, as it will be in the following uh, movies. And now it seems to slow down. And you really see these really amazing um, big objects here. And this was at a high velocity of 30 meters per second, a film thickness of one millimeter. <laughs> And so that's the schematic uh, of the flow. It has 30 centimeters long, one centimeter high. My impulse airflow here. 
And now we can look at it from the top. It's a slower velocity of 15 meters per second. And you see this wave forming, like the waves that uh, Brock and London wanted to study. And you see the, the films bursting. You see the, uh, the sheets being uh, forming bags, like here, for example, or like here, and bursting. And of course, it's very complex. Overall, you have many waves, and now at the bottom, have, but the waves continue to form and break. And sheets and bags continue to form and break. Right till the end. There have been uh, similar experiments in the past, for example, the, the experiments uh, of the group of Cartelier and Hopfinger and Reynal and others in Grenoble, but they uh, did not involve an impulsive flow as here. So that's, a, so that's a higher speed flow. Still the top view. So now you see smaller bags. Of course, you can see the droplets moving more rapidly. And so this is a whole um, complicated um, soup of uh, ligaments and bags and sheets that forms. Interestingly, you have a second wave that formed behind this one. Um, and another way to look at it is to, uh, to look at the distance of this, uh, this wave from the origin. So this is the, the movie with the red line being the distance. And this is the, uh, the plot of the distance as a function of time. And you see it follows the linear law. And so basically the, the, the bump or the sheet moves at a constant velocity. And this velocity is known as the Dimotakis velocity. This is an old... Um, um, uh, um, uh, heuristic estimate, an estimate based on approximate pressures based on Bernoulli's law that uh, gives you uh, or on um, uh, inertial drag and gives you the uh, the speed of the wave as a function of uh, the the gas density and uh, and velocity. So. It, it works rather well. Once we have made looked at the wave, we can look at the bags that fall on top of the wave. So here are the bags. And here are some other bags. The difference between uh, the two is a uh, a different uh, overall uh, uh, mechanism, but it's it's a it's a different bag case. But they, there is no you. The, the, I will explain the difference a little later. So here in the se second case, you have uh, two weak spots that appear, two holes, and then they expand, and in. Uh, in this case, you have many more holes and uh, you get this more complicated uh, event. So the, the small droplets are droplets smaller than 15, 50 microns. The, the rim that forms at the side of the bags um, gives you much larger droplets, larger than 200 microns. 
Um, so, um, mm, uh, if you look at the whole diameter itself, it also seems to um, evolve uh, linearly. And this gives you a retraction velocity, which is known as the Taylor Kulig velocity. It has been, the Taylor Kulig velocity has been studied um, quite intensively by both numerical and experimentally. So we are quite confident that this is the retraction velocity. If we measure the retraction velocity by fitting a slope here, we can indirectly measure the thickness of the sheet that gives rise to the bag. And we have a distribution of uh, sheet sizes, and we also, uh, which I will talk about a little later, and we also have a distribution of uh, final droplet diameter. So the distribution diameters looks like this. And we can fit it quite nicely to a log normal. So um, that is um, a very nice result. And if we try to fit it by gamma, it, it doesn't work that well. It, it's clearly off, at least in the central region, maybe not on this side, but here, of course, there are very, very small droplets, which are maybe difficult to count or see. Mm, if we change the viscosity, the, um, it's still a log normal, but the, the peak of the log, log normal moves to, um, to smaller sizes. And if we look at all the, the measurements together, we get a transition between a low Ornesorg, a low viscosity case, which has a size around 25 micron, to a large viscosity case with a size um, between 10 and 15 microns. Um, maybe this corresponds to an inertial regime and a viscous regime, although I wouldn't be able to say. Mm. So we can look at the influence of uh, viscosity. And so this is a low viscosity case. So you see a relatively, uh, um, relatively dense distribution of uh, sheets and ligaments. And this is the high viscosity case. And you see that the, you also have a dense distribution of bags and ligaments, but you also have much smaller droplets. That's quite obvious. So we had a first burst of droplets, and now we are going to have a second burst. So the, the, the interest of viscosity can also be seen by looking at the size of the bags. So and the width of the bags. So we can um, look at the distributions of, uh, of widths, uh, of, sorry, of size or length L of the bags. So they are much longer for larger viscosity. The fact that they are longer means that they are also thinner. Because the initial volume is approximately the same. So longer bags means thinner bags. It means thinner sheet thickness. And that was also measured, but uh, I don't have the PDF here. So essentially, you get thinner bags. You also see they are wider and longer. So they're essentially thinner. And actually, no, I said I didn't have the distribution, but I have the distribution here. This is a distribution of the, the, the thickness of the bag, the thickness H, measured by the Taylor Kulik velocity. And the, the distribution, the statistics are not so good, but clearly you see that um, you have mm, the blue um, histogram is at uh, uh, for thicker bags. So that is the conclusion for the experiment. And the main conclusion is that viscosity promote, for, promotes formation of deeper, wider, and thinner bags, and thus generates smaller droplets. So basically, if your saliva is more viscous, you're going to make smaller droplets. I don't think it has any 
real consequence for the disease, but it has a consequence because it leads us to think about the mechanism that leads to uh, this uh, back formation and hole formation. And I will say a few words about that later, if there is enough time. Just a few words about the numerics, which were done by Cesar Peretti and uh, Raphael Villiers. Uh, we uh, use, um, again, volume of fluid and the basilisk code as before. We set up the simulation like this. We first set up a simulation with a very large velocity, 30 meters per second, and um, a thin film. So that gives you huge Reynolds and Weber numbers. Um, uh, but uh, in fact, the, uh, despite the fact that the Reynolds numbers is so large, the Kolmogorov length scale is larger than the grid size. And so we can be in some, by some definition of DNS, we are close to a DNS. By other definition, when you see in the details of the simulation, you see that the, you get this kind of filaments here, which are not quite physical. So you, you need to go at higher resolutions. So you have a kind of bag here that's supposed to form, but it's not perfect. And here you see the vorticity behind the sheet. So you, you see the kind of turbulence that forms in the wake of these bags. Um, we see the distribution droplet sizes. Again, we see a Pareto distribution. Uh, probably the reason we don't see a log normal distribution is that we don't resolve the sheet thickness and go, can go below the sheet thickness. And then we go back to the smaller Reynolds and Weber of the experiments. And we get a sheet which is much more regular in the conditions close to the experiment. And we get the beginning of the formation of this bag here in this corner. So we are on the verge of reproducing the bag formation, but we are not quite there yet. I'm sorry for the cat. This is the vagaries of uh, working from home. Uh, So, um, and here we'll, I have a slow movie of this uh, uh, whole formation in the, in the numerics. One thing you see the numerics that I couldn't show to you before, you see this the formation of drop, as I said, on the edge of the hole. You have these uh, small ligaments ejected from the edge of the hole that give you these droplets. They have been, of course, experiments that show that also. And uh, here we see them in the numerics. And the size of these droplets is closely related to the, to the thickness of this sheet. So the, the conclusion again, that we again see a Pareto distribution. Uh, we have also information on droplet velocity and production rate. So we could um, uh, perform uh, additional studies of how the droplets that are ejected further go away. And uh, one thing we need in the numerics is a method to do controlled thin sheet breakup. This was happening because of numerics that you have seen uh, several times. Another thing that's a future perspective is to find out what's the viral load of each droplet, how much virus is there in the small droplets? Is it concentrated on the surface of the droplets or the volume of the droplets? That's also an important aspect. And with that, I think, uh, Francesco, this is the time, 45 minutes. So I'm going to, uh, to stop here. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation. And uh, well, I would say then let's just open the stage for, for questions. Yes, if you allow me, before you start asking the questions, I'm going to expel the cat from the room because I don't know whether you heard the cat, but it's very <laughs> noisy. Sure, sure, no problem. Excuse me for that. Okay, I have expelled the cat. Sorry about that. 
it's okay. So let's let's. Uh, I I see already someone who unmute. Uh, is mine, Michael? Uh, do you want to to ask a question? Um, you 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 speak to me, yeah? Uh, yes, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Stefan, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Just a, a small question. You uh, mentioned the primary instability. What kind of primary instability? And you also mentioned impulsive flow. What is the typical acceleration of uh, impulsive flow? And does it um, impact on the structure of uh, uh, filaments formation or droplets formation? Uh, uh, very good questions, Michal. Thank you. Uh, um, so the primary instability is, uh, is clearly a Kelvin Helmholtz instability. It has been studied in, in detail by a really, a really a large number of people and including us, but also many other people. And uh, for example, in the Grenoble experiment, we found an, uh, an agreement between uh, the, the primary instability. It's a noise driven uh, or basically turbulence, uh, turbulent noise driven Kelvin Helmholtz instability. So mm -hmm. uh, the most recent work by this is by my former postdoc, uh, U.S. Stanley Link and um, by uh, uh, and by Jean-Philippe Matas of Lyon. Mm. Uh, certainly you know him. So they did yeah. some interesting work on this primary instability and uh, really very, um, very subtle comparisons. Mm -hmm. uh, on the second issue, the impulsive flow, unfortunately, I must tell you, we don't know. Uh, we don't know enough. Um, our estimate is that the flow establishes on the scale of milliseconds maybe five, 10 milliseconds, but we were not able need either experimentally or numerically mm -hmm. to uh, vary the time scale of the impulse. So we don't know what would happen if we made the impulse faster or slower. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I cannot answer that, but it's an interesting question or people already asked us the question. So mm -hmm. certainly uh, something to investigate in the future. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. So I see there is... Uh... Uh, uh, Stefan, a, a quick question from yes. Christo. Yes, uh, If you uh, put uh, some emphasis on determining the PDF of sizes, and you talked about various shapes, Gaussian and Pareto and so forth, for practical applications, uh, with what accuracy do you need to know this PDF? Excellent question. Uh, for practical applications, uh, you see, if a droplet is... Uh, uh, is uh, 20 microns, it um, takes approximately uh, 20 minutes to fall to the ground, okay? So mm -hmm. basically, uh, if you're in a restaurant where people, and you stay three hours in a restaurant, you stay many times the droplet falling rate. So uh, it's significant. If it takes 20 minutes to fall, all these droplets are, are away after 20 minutes, okay? Uh, and so it's important to know whether any droplets smaller than 20 microns, which will stay even longer, uh, if you are in a football stadium, which is sort of close from the above, and uh, can the droplets uh, stay three hours and fall back on your head after having floated in the turbulence for a very long time? Um, uh, what if you know the, the characteristics of the turbulence in your room and the motions are centimeters per second or on the scale of the motion of the, the droplets? So it's extremely different if there are no droplets smaller than, say, 10 microns. It's very different if there are lots of droplets smaller than 10 microns. That will make a big difference, according to me. Uh, uh, according to the epidemiologist, you know, it has been a, this has been a huge debate whether, you know, these small droplets are important or not. For the doctors, the epidemiologists, they had fought this idea. They basically told us we don't need fluid mechanics. So they don't need answer to your question. They don't need to answer to any of the questions that we can ask as fluid mechanicians. So you have the two extremes here. You have people like me who say, no, it's extremely important to know the small droplets, to, to know how long they stay in a given turbine situation. And um, well, and then how you can do experiments. I see. I guess for them, the viral load is perhaps more important. 
yes, the viral load is very important. And in fact, the error at the beginning of the pandemic was they thought that because the viral load, the minimum viral load, the minimal infective dose was rather large, they thought the small droplets were unimportant because they said, okay, if the viral, if the, the small droplets were important, then a single individual could infect you know, 50 people, okay? And this was not seen to happen so frequently, except in some of the very large clusters. So because they, the R0 was of the, the alpha variant was um, around 2.5, they said it's impossible if it was airborne, if it was aerosol, it would not be 2.5, but it would be 10 or 15. But now we are here with Omicron, which has a R0 of 10 or 15, so or more. You know? So you know, for measles, for example, some people say the R0 is 60. So really it's super, uh, spreads super fast. And the reason, and if it spreads so fast, that means it has a small infective dose and it can be carried by a small number of, I mean, a small fraction of the total number of droplets, a small, the small fraction that is uh, of very small size. And one last question. I assume that uh, uh, clustering of droplets and uh, thereby becoming bigger is, as, is negligible in, in this case? Oh, the coalescence you mean? Yes. Ah, oh, that's an excellent question. An excellent question. Uh, um, we um, it's generally believed that there's a first stage of atomization, kind of burst, uh, where there is very little coalescence. But then there is a second stage. As soon as you trap the droplets inside vorticity, etc., then you start having some coalescence. So it's a question of time scale. If you wait relatively long, you will have uh, some um, amount of coalescence. But by, if you wait Long also the, the, the cloud becomes more dilute, so that also reduces the probability of coalescence. You need to have this cloud trapped in a, in a small region. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, thank you. I think there is a question for uh, Arvind. You can unmute your mic if you want. Yeah. Thanks, Stefan, uh, for the nice talk. Uh, very interesting. I have several questions to you. Um, now, one is um, when we when we typically talk about droplet breakup and so on, um, in especially in uh, combustion systems, we talk about uh, the shorter mean diameter, and you know there is this three stages of droplet. I mean, some of what you've presented was quite similar, but still, uh, some of what you presented was a bit different. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so what are the main differences when you look uh, actually like a pressure swirl or automizer, mm -hmm. uh, which is then putting out the spray in the combustion chamber as compared to uh, what you showed? Mm -hmm. Okay. What are the main differences? Um, I would say um, then it's not so, they're not so real differences, but there is a, a different view. Uh, um, maybe. Um, better visualizations, better movies than we used to have before. And also, also we have this uh, variation of viscosity, which was not done so systematically before. If you uh, look at uh, many of the experiments, I, I don't think people look in so much um, detail at the effect of, uh, of viscosity. In fact, I, I, when I gave this talk, at the APS in Phoenix, someone told me it's very well known that viscosity has this effect, but he didn't give me any reference. So if someone in this room thinks it's very well known, please give me the reference. Uh, for me, this is really the first time we show that higher viscosity leads to smaller droplets. But maybe yeah. someone did it before. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's quite counterintuitive, actually, that uh, higher yeah. viscosity forms smaller droplets, right? I mean, that's, that was very, very interesting to see. And, and and these these two peaks that you showed in the mm -hmm. beginning, mm -hmm. yes, right. Um, um, you mean that was uh, also very interesting and counterintuitive to me, actually, at least to me. The two peaks, you mean uh, probably somewhere here, here. Is this the ones you mean? The two peaks. Well, in in the, oh, the at the very beginning. The, yeah, in the oh, earlier uh, slides. The B model, the B model, uh, the bimodal one. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, so that is. Yes, that is here. 
Yes, yes, yes. But this, in fact, is an experiment. So you know, we, you cannot say the experiment must be right. Okay, uh, it's possible that this bimodal comes from you have the rim droplets, the 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 edge of uh, of the, the this sheet that gives you bigger droplets, and then the film droplets or the droplets coming. Um, um, expelled at the at the beginning of the whole formation. That's that could be a, one explanation for the bimodal, and um, the multimodal are just a superposition of a lot of uh, bimodals like this. Mm. And we, it's well known that the bag mechanism of atomization leads to bimodal distributions. That 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 is, again, and if you want to know what is new here, no, the the bimodal is not new. No, uh, but, I mean, this is uh, still very, uh, very interesting. I mean, coming back to um, let's say the, the virus propagation as such. Mm -hmm. um, what is your view when it comes comes to ventilation, right? So, the, so the and ventilation is supposed to have a very strong effect. Yes. How, how do you correlate that in terms of the droplet breakup and? Okay, uh, once <laughs> um, if we take a typical room um, with closed windows, the, the motion are due to um, um, thermal buoyancy, so maybe 20 centimeters per second. Uh, um, once you open the windows, you could probably uh, maybe uh, at least near the window, you have some turbulence in the air a bit faster. And then really you're outside, it's, it's even faster. Or if you have a, a draft, it's faster. So, uh, as uh, when you are in the mm, twenty centimeters per second region, that's probably where you're the most sensitive to small droplets because uh, um, that at those speeds, um, it's really the small droplets that don't fall to the ground. When when you are you have strong drafts at a meter per second, you you will mobilize even bigger droplets. Uh, so, I would say ventilation allows you to uh, to mobilize a bigger droplets so that in the sense that is dangerous but uh, also these bigger droplets will go away faster so it's safer mm, so i would say overall uh, mm, it seems to me that the most the b biggest danger is from the small droplets because the the large droplets will be evacuated relatively quickly and what uh, and so what really is this danger is the accumulation. If you stay for uh, in a room with someone for a long time, or if you enter a room where someone has stayed for a long time, then this person will have emitted a lot of small droplets, and these small droplets will still be floating in the room when you enter the room or while you are with this person. So, for example, it's a seminar room. We did the experiments in the seminar room. Um, we believe the small droplet concentration is proportional to the CO2 concentration. Hmm. Of course, this is not the concentration of uh, disease carrying small droplets, because that depends on whether the people in the room are contaminated. But if you assume a, a fixed ratio of people being contaminated, then the CO2 is proportional to your risk of being contaminated. And it's uh, we, we did the experiment in our lab, we have a CO2 uh, measurement device and when we open uh, the windows it stays near 430 ppm so you know 430 ppm this is a famous number because it both gives you the result of uh, human co2 uh, emissions from fossil fuels and at the same time it tells you the danger of covid so the two big problems of the planet are together in the number of 430 ppm of co2 and if you close the windows you see the the PPM going up um, at the rhythm of maybe um, 20 PPM per hour and per person. So if you have uh, 10 people, you go up by 200 PPM. You have 50 people, you go up to 1,000 PPM. And it's, it's, it's very nice, a nice linear increase of the CO2. It's very, very nice. You open the windows, it goes away. Now, so my point of view in ventilation, if you, basically, if it's winter, and you feel warm in your room, it's, you, you, you are in danger. But if it's winter and you are cold in your seminar room, you have well mixed the air with the outside air and you are safe. But so the warmth should cold also or be in evaporation, right? 
Ah, evaporation, excellent. That's really a, a tricky part. Okay, let's uh, let the droplet stay in the air for a long time. It will evaporate. We can compute the evaporation rate. Actually, in one of our papers with uh, Balashandar, uh, uh, we, we have computed the evaporation rate. So it, it stays Pareto, but the Pareto moves to smaller sizes. Uh, but then there are some non-volatile components in the droplet because it comes from your salivary fluid and there are some big molecules. So it becomes a kind of viscous non-volatile particle. Is the virus going to survive uh, this? Well, you could say it's a, there's no reason it wouldn't survive. Uh, it's coated by lipid layer, so it, it's happy there and no problem. Or you could say no, because the, there will be osmotic pressure because of these non-volatile components and uh, maybe it's salty, so the virus will burst. In fact, we don't know. If you look at the literature, some people say the virus will survive 15 hours floating, the other people say no. So, um, so in fact, the fact that it's evaporated, it's not a guarantee, that's what I'm saying. So if you want to be safe, you cannot count on evaporation. Yeah. But it, because it evaporates, it will float more easily, so it go go on going go up more easily. Yeah. So if it is if the air is humid, it will um, it will not go up so fast, and maybe it will uh, uh, it will fall to the ground. So yeah, I mean when you look at the the diameter of uh, the SARS CoV virus, I mean it's it's around hundred nanometers or less than that. Mm, so even yes. if you have a droplet of around 10 microns, that is quite a huge space for a lot of viruses. Yes, it is, but we don't know how many. So, um, you know, people uh, basically have been uh, uh, looking at droplets individually um, and looking, making, using uh, devices to test for the virus. And so they find virus, not in all the droplets, but in some of the droplets. So that it's, yeah, at least for this experiment, they were not, there was not that much virus. Um, they not, they were, but maybe it changes with Omicron. One thing that can change is not only the, uh, the minimal infective dose, but how many viruses you emit. That's also something that is important. Yeah. For example, with uh, Omicron, you tend to have symptoms which are like uh, cold. So maybe you sneeze more with Omicron than with uh, Alpha or Delta. So if you sneeze more of Omicron, then it makes Omicron more dangerous. Yeah, yeah indeed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a very you. enlightening talk. So thank you for uh, for replying to to the questions. Is there anyone? Is there any more questions? Uh, to uh, is there someone else who wants to ask a question? Just feel free to unmute your mic or uh, uh, write in the chat and I can report it. Uh, so maybe I can ask one uh, uh, question from, from, from my side. I think it's, uh, it would be interesting to, to actually comment also on the effect of the honest orgue model, uh, on the honest orgue number, like the, yeah surface tension effect kind of thing. Um, can, can you tell us something about it and uh, how does it change the distributions and uh, uh, how it affects uh, the dynamics uh, of breakup and uh, atomization? This is an excellent question. Um, we don't know. Um, and there are two numbers that involve viscosity and surface tension. There is the capillary number, mu u over sigma, and there is the honest organ number, which involves mu, sigma, and r. And, um, and we don't know which of these two numbers is uh, most significant. Uh, of course, the capillary number is the only number that does not involve a priori uh, the thickness of the, the sheets. Um, but, um, Frankly, we don't know. Uh, um, how should I say that we uh, we don't we don't really know how these two uh, uh, these two numbers involve the the, the distribution. So we um, 
we would need to do more systematic experiments in the, the 20 group um, part of country would need to do more systematic experiments with the varying both uh, viscosity and, uh, and velocity. And we need to understand the mechanism by which viscosity promotes uh, small droplets. Uh, that's something that uh, I have not discussed, but the, the mechanism is important. So um, if I, uh, and so if, if we understand the mechanism, we will know the answer to your question. Okay, okay, thanks. Now I was, I was thinking to that also because I mean, I imagine that uh, um, like people by people, they kind of have a different uh, uh, concentration of surfactants in the saliva liquids. And so the surface tension is going to change based on, on the case you consider, based on how sick a person is. And uh, yeah. also, yeah, absolutely, forces. surfactants uh, play a role. That, that's, that's for sure. Uh, so here I show uh, maybe uh, surface tension gradients can be also due to, to surfactants. Surfactants will prevent the thin sheets from breaking. Yeah. So we prevent hole formation. We need to understand the mechanism of hole formation, so-called the weak spot mechanism. And um, we don't understand that uh, very well. Yeah, that's, um, I think I think in general, um, um, one kind of uh, open question is how fast they they are capable to react to to topological deformation or change mm -hmm. in uh, yeah. uh, because yeah. that's uh, that may affect uh, somehow the time scale you were discussing about before uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, how fast a, a ligament kind of retracts mm -hmm. uh, with yeah. respect to how fast it breaks and that kinds of changes yes, exactly yes um, that's uh, okay exactly. okay. Um, and I have another uh, question that's not much related to, to the physical topic of your talk, but more to the numerics you mentioned before, because, I mean, whoever um, deals with uh, multiphase flows, especially if there are like small droplets or small thin sheets, at a certain point runs down, runs out of uh, resolution and uh, finds uh, some kind of unphysical uh, um, patterns in the uh, in the liquid front. And uh, can you kind of comment on it or give us some advice about the uh, a resolution that's uh, somehow expected to surface uh, for uh, well resolving the flow topology or the front topology or uh, okay of Mac and Laurel Tom. Good, good, good question. Uh, typically, um, you form thin sheets, uh, so then the thin sheets break like here, um, and if you zoom in this region, you see the the thin sheets. Uh, do not break properly. Um, so we made the uh, super high resolution experiments. And then once we have uh, sufficiently high resolution, like here or, or here, then we can break the, the sheets properly. For example, like here, okay. We can break them almost properly. Let me, I need to stop this and maybe go back. Okay. So here we, we have a, a, a critical situation. You see, that's a critical, this is a critical resolution. We have maybe um, two, three grid points in the sheet. Oh. And then we get all these little holes. Um, I'm not sure I can zoom on that, but, uh, oh, sorry, it didn't work. Uh, I'll try to zoom to show you more, more clearly. Okay. So you still see my presentation, right? Uh, no, no, no. You don't see the presentation? No, I need to reshare it. Yes. Okay, now you see it, right? Yeah. Okay, so if I, now do you see the, the, the presentation being zoomed or not? Uh, no, uh, maybe not. No, right? yeah, now yes. Now yes. you see it being zoomed. Uh, but at the same time, I lose the movie, but. Okay, so you see here, 
Yes. The, this, these tiny little uh, holes here, okay? Mm -hmm. So this means that you don't have enough resolution. But um, if I had really not enough resolution, I would end up like before with uh, strangely looking ligaments. But in this case, if I continue a little bit, now I have a nice, well-defined hole. And, and now again, I have enough resolution, okay? So there is a transient time. There is a, a critical time when you don't have enough resolution. You need to have sheets that are really, um, to reach the level where you have sheets that are really well resolved, as you have here, the rest of the sheet is well resolved. And, and that's when you can start having enough resolution for the, uh, for the, 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 the sheet and ligament and bag mechanism of atomization. It's, it's very difficult to reach this, uh, this uh, sufficient resolution. And I assume that if you don't have enough resolution at the very beginning, but the kind of evolution of, of the topology is very fast, mm. the front kind of loses the memory very fast and you can yes. regain uh, uh, yes. like a physical uh, development yes. of your that's yeah. correct. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, you. you uh, one way of looking at this is going back to my kind of historical slide here. So you, you can see how the the various uh, mm, the various historical atomization simulations are different. You see this this one looks completely different from uh, this one or this one. Here mm -hmm. you you have you start seeing the sheets and the ligaments, and here you. Uh, you, it's, uh, this one is approximately the same, the blue one and the green one are approximately similar. And uh, Raphael, who is in the room here, he has done even um, the more, a more refined simulation, which I haven't shown, and where you, you start uh, seeing things um, in even more detail. So, uh, in fact, this is something we have not published yet. This is something that we are in the, in the course of publishing, this, uh, this uh, ultimate uh, resolution effects. Uh, the resolution sufficient to clearly see the holes in the sheets. Okay, okay, that's uh, that sounds very very interesting, at least from the uh, technical point of view of whoever is using uh, uh, multi-phase codes. That's uh, that's usually a big issue. Um, okay, thanks a lot. Um, let's see if there is someone else who would like to ask a question. So just uh, once again, feel free to unmute your mic or to write in the chat. There is someone who wrote something in the chat. Um, okay, in, just good evening. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that doesn't seem to 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 be the case. So thank you once again, Stefan, for. Uh, for the presentation of today it was really, really interesting. And uh, as you saw, it kind of raised a lot of questions. Uh, that was a good uh, start for the webinars uh, of LMFL uh, 2022. Thank you, uh, okay. thanks once again. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. As I told you uh, in private, um, it's a pity I couldn't visit your lab and be there physically in your lab. Yeah, next time for sure we, we are going to organize a, a seminar rather than a webinar. Okay. So, thank okay. you. Uh, and have a good evening to everyone. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Stefan. Bye-bye. Okay. okay, goodbye. Thank you.